we are. Crew Markle. Every fishing trip, it seems, starts with getting the bait. It's most important, isn't it? At this time of the year, especially in South Devon, where we are today. There's plenty of mackerel around, but sometimes it takes a bit of time. We've had a, we've had a couple of other spots where we haven't had a fish, but you know, what nice mackerel they are. They make nice fillets. Get a nice size off of those shortly. But we've also got some sand eel to use as well, so between the two, we should catch a few fish today. So never be afraid to spend a bit of time getting bait, even if it takes half an hour or even an hour. It's time well spent. Now when you prepare your bait, you need to be neat and fussy, because I, I think that fish are fussy as well. Now, you wouldn't like to have a meal that was not prepared properly. So take your fillet off using a shark knife, nice and cleanly. Clean off the, the gunge. If you get a mackerel that's thick, take off, take off some of the flesh. You don't want it too thick when it's in the water. Providing it's not too thick, then it flaps nicely. Now there's lots of ways you can cut mackerel. You can cut it like that, so you get a, like pieces like that. You can cut it that way, you can cut it long ways, or you can just square it up and use long ones like we were using today. In which case, if you want to do that, Take away the, the belly, and you could square up a piece off the side, keeping it nice and square. I usually take that off. Some do and some don't. And I have seen some anglers take pieces off the corner, but I'm quite happy myself to use it like that. The important thing at the beginning of the day, of course, is, trying, is preparation, as I've said, about getting mackerel. And that's getting the rubby dubby ready. Not a lot of people use rubby dubby, but if more did, I feel sure that they would have more success. It's always a dirty, filthy job. But Adrian's used to this. He gets his hands in it and mixes it all up. It's all good stuff. All you need to do is get what we're doing today. We've got some mackerel. We've got some of the coarse fishing scents that we pour in on top. Mixed up mackerel. Put it, put it all into an onion bag. You can get plenty of those from the uh, green grocers. And then when we're settled down and anchored, we should, we should just drop that over the side and then we're ready. And what, what happens is that this runs a nice scent all the way down the line, all the way down along the seabed and attracts a fish. We note how many lead weights we've got hung on there. That's to counteract the tie because we want that to hang right down on the bottom. And the idea, of course, is that when it's down on the bottom, it will lay there and all that lovely smell and juices, it'll all go down on the tie, 100, 200, 300 yards. And anything that's in its way, hopefully, will come back up and find air baits. It does, a, it does unfortunately, attract uh, quite a lot of small fish when you do that. But you have to put up with that, especially the small dogfish that tear the baits to pieces. If you keep checking the bait, it's no problem. Oh, you've got plenty of bait, of course. Well, the method we're using today is down tide fishing. That's dropping the baits and the weights over the stern or over the side and just working them back astern of the boat. The other method which we could use would be up tiding. That's casting up to the bow of the boat and letting the boat line bow around. But the depth of water is really too great for that where we're fishing today. So we're concentrating on down tiding and the rods that I've chosen to use, I've got one that's eight foot because 
I quite like using that. It's quite a powerful rod. It gives me the opportunity of keeping away from other people. The, my other rod is a 20 pound rod and that's a six foot six. I much prefer to use the longer rod really, but this is quite powerful. It's a carbon rod and it's a 20 pound tip. So hopefully if I get one of the bigger ray later in the day, it'll cope with that adequately. Multipliers, you don't need to be too big, not for the ray that we're catching in this particular area. I've got a 7,000 and a 6,600. Both are adequate. One is loaded with 30 pound line and the other is loaded with 20. Well, it might seem a bit odd that I've got 35 pound line on one reel and 20 pound on the other, but that's in case we go on to the ray pit in which there's some really big blonde ray, then I will only use the one reel and rod with a heavier line on. That's great, Pat. Well done, mate. It's, uh, what do you reckon that one is, Pat? Ten? Ten, yeah. yeah. Nine, so, ten pounds. I would have thought so. Gives us the opportunity now, of course, to have a quick look at the blonde ray. As we said, it's not a great big one, but it's around about ten pound. You can see they've got fairly uniform spots all over. You've got more or less only two sizes the bigger one and the smaller one there and you've got these little white blotches which are fairly uniform all over the, the ray. The spines up come up the tail but they stop about at the top there, just about there. But the easy way to tell is the only ray that has the spots which go right out to the wing edges which you can see there. On all other rays they tend to stop with about an inch border at least all round. Because the rays live on the bottom they have difficulty in breathing when they're laying flat, of course. So they have these spiracles on top of the head, which are behind the eyes, which they suck in air and water, or water rather, through there. And you can see how they close, open and close. And we can just see how big that is, what happens. That comes out, it's almost telescopic really, when it's, when it's laying on the bottom and feeding. That opens out and it sucks the food right inside. And they don't have teeth as such, perhaps like the sharks, uh, they, although they are teeth. They're very close together, more like grinders. And you mustn't put your hand or finger in there because they really do some damage and it's not easy to get out. Well, there's one other thing you might like to know about the uh, skates and the rays, and that's they classify it as a, a round fish and not a flat fish. And that's because they're flattened downwards from top to bottom, unlike the flounders and the place, which are flattened sideways. And the huge disc, or the wing of the skate, is its pectoral fins. And they, over, over the years, that's how that's evolved. And that's the way that they sort of fly through the water. That's their propellant. And the dorsal fin, is right on the tip of the tail. Now that's quite unusual, but those two little fins on this particular species is a dorsal fin. Okay. So, Pat, we're going to put him back. Yeah. Do you normally put all your fish back? Put a lot back. Um, if we can eat them, or well, we're not going to eat them, put them back. 
it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense, really, doesn't it? Because fish are scarce now. Well, yeah, somebody can have perhaps ten anglers to catch that one over the next few years. So it's one more for them. It doesn't seem to affect them either, does it? They no. swim away quite happily. Yeah. Yep. That's right. right. Okay, we can step him back. Yeah. Conservation is very important. You know, he's coming up too easy, really. There's a bit of pool there. I'm not quite sure. It's not even like a running tope, so I'm not really quite sure what's happening to this. Straight up and down. The trouble is, oh, I think it's a big bull ass. I think I can, I can feel a tail or something back in the line. It's a taupe. It's a taupe. Oh, I wonder that's the one that's been after us all day, pinching her bait. I get yeah. Well done. Thank you. Tag the fish. You can just note there. Just goes straight in the dorsal fin. And it misses. <laughs> it's, that's right. Lovely. This one is Fisheries Board Ireland, and it says on there that you actually get a reward. You just notice that the tail is different on the tope. It's um, it's the only one I know of for the shark family. It's got a complete notch out there. It's unmistakable. This is a, of course, a male tope. I'm not quite sure what the weight of this is. My best one many years ago was £49 a male, but this one wouldn't go that. I suspect this one, what, 30-ish? Yeah, 30 25. 20, 25 to 30, this one, yeah. It's, uh, 59 inches, yes, yeah. Greg? Mm. See, the thing is, when we put tote back these days, we we don't want to hang them up 20. and weigh them. Make it in, 20. 20. It's much better just to measure them and then we can slip them back over the side again. On well, these days of conservation and trying to preserve the species, especially tope, we don't want to damage the tope more than we have to, so they're only measured. We don't hang them up and weigh them or anything. There's no point, really. We know what it is, we've caught it. So we'll just get the hook out and we'll just drop him back overboard again. Right, come on then, my oh, beauty. Away we go. Let's just put you down in there. Oh. I just hold him by the tail first till he gets his strength up. All right, I think we're all right. And away he goes. Yeah, he's all right. Yeah, there he goes. Look at that. Hello, I'm Mick Toomer, and today I'm fishing out of Lymington aboard Roger Bizan's charter vessel, Sundance 2. The boat itself is a 10 metre starfish capable of over 20 knots. However, it's a bit lumpy outside today, so we won't be needing that sort of speed, and we'll be fishing inside the nice sheltered waters of the Solon. Very nice and calm in here, Roger. Can you tell us yeah. exactly where we are? We're right in the middle of the Solent. We're on the edge of the main channel in the Solent. Right opposite Soli Boom on the mainland shore. Yep. We've got Newtown Creek over there on the Isle of Wight. And right up ahead of the boat, we've got the Needles. That's right at the western end of the Isle of Wight. Smash it. Now, today we'll be boat casting. And uh, how are we going for the state of tide for boat casting at the moment, Roger? Well, we've still got a bit of tide left. We've got a little bit of flood tide left now. We're going to have an hour or so of fishing before slack water. So we'll get a little bit of fishing in now. 
so better make a start. Well, you better make a start now. Right. Get on with it. Let's just have a look at the tackle I'll be using today. Right. The rod, as you can see, is much longer than a conventional boat rod. We need this for casting. When you've got a lot of people in a boat, the last thing you want is to be casting and have your tackle around them. The long rod makes the casting easier. It also means you can actually hang your tackle outside of the boat whilst you're casting. Now the action of the rod is quite important as well. We need a rod that's fairly stiff at the bottom, a little bit of movement for playing fish in the middle, and with quite a lot of movement in the tip. This is most important. When we've cast away from the boat and got our lead hooked into the bottom, if the boat moves, there's a danger that it will pull the lead out. This bit of movement in the tip absorbs that movement. When we started boat casting, we were using cut down beach casters. These days, anglers are a lot more fortunate. You have rods you can actually buy kit for the job. Now this one, this is a Daiwa Carbo Whisker. Lovely rod, very, very light. As we can see, plenty of power in the bottom. Going through, bit of action. Movement at the top. Moving on to reels, the reels need to have several attributes. They need to hold quite a lot of line because we're using relatively light line, 15 pounds line, 18 pounds line. Now, if you hook a big fish in a lot of tide on that lighter line, you need to be able to let it take line. So we need a reel that holds 250, 300 yards of line. We also need a reel with a good clutch. Here's a peeler crab, taking the back off, and just hook it through. Now some people like to tie their crabs on with cotton. If at all possible, I, I like to avoid it. Cast fairly gently, I can get away with it, and uh, the fish seem to prefer it that way. Let's cast out and get going. Think to remember, safety at all times. Keep your tackle outside of the boat and cast up tide and across the tide. Once your weights hit water, you let the line keep going. It'll come to a small bump as it hits the bottom, as it has there. And then let more line run out as the tide pulls the line down. This gives you a nice little bow in the line and holds your lead hard in the bottom. We're losing the tide a little bit now, so I won't need to let as much line out as I would had it been steaming through. I think I've got an inquiry. I've changed over to, oh, look at that. I've changed over to a breakaway. So, oh. And it just came straight out of the bottom. And it's come straight to the top. I've got a big lump of weed and something is on. Ah, ha, 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 ha. I cast very, very close to the boat because of the weed. And I've had a, a big. Uh, Roger! Got a net, mate? Yeah. We've got, oh, we got a spiky creature. He's, he's wrapped up in weed. I don't think, oh, he, knows I what's, I don't think he knows what's going on yet. Okay. He, he hasn't done a lot at all. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what's going on yet. Oh, beautiful fish. Yeah. Lovely bass. I'll I've come around that short side line all the time. I only just, only just chucked it out the side of the boat. Oh, lovely. Look at that. Oh, you yeah. so and so. Oh, you so and so. Oh, so. You so and so. Wonderful. Ah, oh, lovely. Ah, oh, superb. Look at that. That's what we want. Oh, that's just what we want. That's what the boys want. <laughs> that is a cracker. That is a cracker. Look at that. Beautiful. Not a scale out of place. As you can see, that didn't fight as well as people say bass do. For two reasons for that. It was wrapped up in a lot of weed and some over it. And bass aren't 
the best fighting fish in the world. On very light gear, in very shallow water, in very clear water, they go well. But otherwise, I've never been over impressed with the fight of them. But they certainly are a beautiful fish. Look at that one, not a scale out of place. Absolutely superb. Yeah. Several things to be wary of with bass. They've got a, a spiky top fin, which you can stick your hands onto and get quite a nasty gash. But worse still, the plates along the side there of the gills are razor sharp and you can end up in a, a lot of bother with them. So, this is a, a lovely fish. Five pounds or so, I suppose. Um, I was getting to despair about getting a bass and come down and first chuck, a very, very short cast, very little line out, and wallop, we've got one. Absolutely lovely, I'm really pleased with that. Always pleased with a bass. That's, that's really nice. Now, the old bass has taken a hiding commercially over the past few years. They're worth quite a lot of money, a silly amount of money, I feel. And it's, it's getting to be a red letter day when you get a bass. Because of that, I don't tend to keep them these days. I had a 12 pounder a few years ago that I've had set up, that's on the wall, that's enough for me. I think, I think we'll put this one back. That's one rod back. Whoa, again. Oh, this one's gone down tight. The trick is, is to keep winding. Wind, 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 wind until you catch up with the fish, which I'm not doing. Oh, cool, mustn't do that. And when you catch up, lean into it. Oh, it's a big this, whatever it is. It's a fish, but it isn't very big. Very shallow water here, mine. Oh, there's a little maid. Little maid, we can come up, little maid. Come on, little maid. Come up, little maid. Cheers. Um, don't really think that one's worth netting. Do you want the net, Mick? Uh, hardly, mate. It's only a, a little maid. I think she'll come in okay. Yep. Nice little maid. Small female thornback. That one would probably just about make the legal size limit, but um, I'm not that hungry for a fish dinner, so this one can go back. get a rod in the water eventually. Where was I? Rods, crabs. The old wind's certainly pushing the line about now. Right. We're in business again. The tide's slackening off now, so this next rod I'll cast further across the tide and that'll pick up a little bit quicker. If I can get it in the water before this one goes again.
try not to let the, the leads bash on the skipper's gunnels. They're never very impressed when you do that. Not the best of crabs now. I'm, now I'm getting a bit short on bait. But, God, oh, I've been done. Look at that. <laughs> Mate of mine said, I've got, got a few uh, peelers left last night. He said, you want them, I throw them in. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, we're out tomorrow. And look at that. He's bowled me a googly. He's thrown one in that's not a peeler. Sorry about that, crab. God. Miserable so-and-so. That one's a peeler. across the quarter that one, that'll pick up a little bit quicker. I think that's about it for today. After that short spell of activity, I've sat here for half hour or so without a bite. The tide's pretty well gone now. The wind's picking up again, and it's, it's yawing the boat across me tackle. But we've had a fairly good day considering. It's been much too rough to get outside, but we've stayed in the shelter, and with Roger making us three or four moves, he's found us a few fish every time, which proves it pays to go with a decent, reputable skipper. And uh, today, Roger's certainly done his work. I did have a, a little tap on one of these rods about 10 minutes ago, I suppose now, a quarter of an hour ago. I thought we was going to get a fish to finish off, but uh, it's come to nothing, unfortunately. But that's the way it is, you know, some you win, some you lose, and today we've... <laughs> I think we've got a lurker. I think. I think. Yeah, we have. We've... Uh, Oh, we got a lucky one here. My little bite that didn't develop. The fish has obviously hung on and he's still sitting there. God. And it's not a bad little fish. There ain't a lot of action in it, but it's a fish and one to finish the day most certainly. A lot of movement with him, but we got a net, please, Roger. I think we're gonna. We got another oh, little roker. Oh look! Oh, I was thought back. Mate. Oh, that was just hanging there. That just, side of you. just, just lurking. That was, mate. Magic! Oh, and I've got my other rod. There's lines are everywhere now with this uh, tide and wind. Cracking! Oh. Lovely. Cheers, Roger. Well, we... that's it. That's that's lovely. Got to be honest, I didn't really deserve that fish, um, but that's the way it goes. Some you win, some you lose. Cracker. Bring it back and let's get on our way, too, Roger. Magic, mate. We've had a cracking day, and you are a very lucky roker. We've arrived at the wreck. We're about 23 miles out, and the weather really has improved beyond anything that we really anticipated. The four that we were supposed to get hasn't materialized. It's about a three, and we seem to be under a nice box of clear blue sky. So uh, all we need, really, is the pollock, because that's what we're going for first. 
So let me tell you a little bit about the really quite simple rig that takes very, very big pollock. It's called the flying collar. That's all it is, it's a long boom. In this case, one of plastic. The line from the reel runs through the boom, a bead at the end, a swivel, and then a very long trace, and on the end of that is an artificial eel. In this particular case, with a fairly good tide run, I'm using 15 feet of 18 pound monofilament. The weight to carry the boom to the bottom, as you can see, is simply on a link, which is nicked to the boom. It's a very, very simple, highly effective rig to catch a pollock. And, uh, hope that we'll be putting one or two good fish on it quite soon. The flying collar. Kevin, it's essential to have the clutch on the um, on the reel set perfectly to suit the, the weight of the line that's uh, on the spool. Now, in your case, that's a, a Promax 20-pound class rod with 20-pound test line on it. So the lever controls the amount of drag and tension on the spool. Yeah. Now, to start off down, obviously, it's free to run, look. Yeah. Easy to run, OK? So after we've started to let down, you control the descent with your thumb all the time. And if you don't do that, you're going to get the most awful overrun and you'll be spending the next half an hour trying to sort out the mess. So it's absolutely essential to control everything with the thumb. So when we start to go in a second, I'll talk you through okay. running down and then the last minute when we're there, you obviously bring your lever forward to set the clutch. Now it's always a good idea that once you're there to just to test. See, that's on too tight, look. See, now look. Yeah. I'm pulling that off just nice. Now a fish could do that. Feel it? Yeah. So okay. So let's have a little run to the bottom and, and see what we can get. There he goes, look. And I'm controlling the control it, let him go. Throw your spool throw your trace out. Your reel, yeah, your reel is always thrown out first. Yep. Just pick up your reel. Pick up your reel and just throw it out. And you're controlling descent. You're all right, has it got a knot in it? You always get rid of that. I think you've made that one a little bit too long, to be honest. I think I'd shorten him down a wee bit. I always think you get two pairs of gloves and they're both right hand or left hand. <laughs> exactly the same time. Coming in. Yes, throw your eel away. It's always a good idea to throw your eel away. You're in the wreck there. Yeah, you're staying too Trevor's in the wreck. Yeah, let him run all the way to the bottom. Set the things up nicely. Look, so that you can see what's happening here. See, he's pulling off quite nicely there now. Let him come off a little bit. And there he is. Not a big fish, though. But he's coming along steady. Yeah, I got him all right. Not a big one, but it's a good start. It's a fish with fins. <laughs> yeah, he's not really putting in any great uh, runs. I like it when they go down so you can't stop them. Beautiful. He had a little jump then. Here he is. Right, right let's have a look at that. Yeah, a little pollock. But it's a pollock, and it is a star. Lovely. Is he in, Trevor? Yeah, yeah. But where there are small ones, there could be big ones. There he is. A Polak. Okay, so this is the pollock. Whoops a daisy, lively fish. The pollock, Pelagius Pelagius. Now this is uh, about four, four and a half, five pounds perhaps. Quite small as wreckfish go, but we'll improve on that during the day. 
But this one took a black eel, which is exactly the same sort as, uh, as mine has just taken, which rather proves the point that black is a catching color today. Okay, so identifying a pollock, you can see that the lateral line on the pollock is quite curved. See, it runs down very, very steeply from the, from the head and then flattens out and runs all the way to the tail. It's really quite, um, it's quite pronounced, look, as it runs down through. Now, the coal fish, as we'll see later on, is very, very straight indeed. And, of course, the coley is a completely different colour. But, but there's the pollock, gold and brown, lovely looking fish, but not big enough. Right, there he goes. That's a better one. Lovely. Whoa, look at that. That's more like it. Beautiful dive. Look at that. Lovely curve on that one, Lloyd. Beauty. Come on, my beauty. The secret, Kevin, is to be smooth. You don't want to go hammering the rod up and down in the air or anything like that. You hold it firmly with your left hand and then wind when the thing has stopped its dive. You then gradually retrieve. And there's yours coming. Okay, so you got that one all right. That's a better one. Lovely. So we're coming along the road here quite nicely. Yes, we're beginning to make progress. Like a nice bit of pollocking. As big as I thought. They're getting better. They are getting better. Yeah, it's not much in it. Good ow. Lovely. About six pounds. Nice fish. Good old. Oh, he took that one deep, Lloyd. He took it deep. Well, the tide has come up to slack water, so we've switched to conger tactics now. We're not actually going to anchor down. We're going to drift very, very slowly over the wreck. So let me show you the the technique and the tackle and also of course perhaps more important of all the bait and, and how it's presented well the tackle i'm using a, a stand-up stick 30 to 50 pound class it's matched up with a multiplier in this case uh, a lever drag fulmer 900 model now the stand-up stick is uh, in classes from a 30 uh, 280. It's all inbuilt into the same rod. Wonderful advantages with that. It has a very, very fast tip, which in fact can almost bend in under itself. There's a tremendous action there. Now the trace, well, it's, it's a 50 pound line, by the way, and the uh, trace itself is 250 pound monofilament. I've got it merely rigged on a little slider. In this case, just a simple swivel, that's all you need. You don't need to go in for sophistication and, and expensive end rigs. It's a swivel connected to the weight. A bead cushions against the swivel of the trace. The trace itself is two and a half feet, 250 pound test monofilament. Now the hook, in this case, it's a 9-0 stainless. Now here's the bait. 
it's a flapper but putting it on the hook take the point find the mouth of the the bait fish push it down as far as you can go and push it back up so that it comes out through there now there that's really very very attractive indeed congress should swallow that no trouble let's go down and see if one will Been specimen hunting for me. <laughs> Tingling. That's a mangy ling on the end of there. Tingling. Oh, Trevor's having a little bend. Oh, God. Right. Name your species then, Liam. Tingling. Right. Okay. Ten points then. A little conga! Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Look, you just you spit the, the mackerel clean out of the... Look, spit, spit the mackerel right away. It's that one goes spinner. back, Kevin. A strap conga caught by the specimen outing. <laughs> got it? Yeah. And a released. Yeah, we don't keep fish this size. And here he goes, away to live again Enjoy. and to grow. That's what that's the tea bar I was telling you about. To become in 25 years a record fish. Today that was all right. We've got half a box of fish which we'll use for bait. Calculating the number so we don't take more than we need. But what we might do on the way back in tonight, if conditions are good, is 
just try and slay a few more for tea time. Blow in a bit of a hoolie, first drops of the day. Pattern at the moment of the boat is quite simple. Everyone else is having a bash at Pollock with artificial lures. This means they're trying to get major predatory species on flowing tray systems. I've taken a gamble and I've dropped a single running ledger down there with bronze hook and a congering rig with a big fat mackerel on the end. So I'm the only one actually bottom fishing with bait. But by doing that, we've covered the odds. This is probably the easiest and simplest technique for going fishing because there is less for me to get tangled up and less for me to lose control of. All the other guys are doing things a bit more techy-techy and a bit more complicated. But at least we're having a general spread by this technique. And then if I make contact with bottom feeding fish and using bait, then they can change over and come that way as well. What I've actually got on here and what I'm up to at the moment is a single presentation to give you some idea of where we are. It's, we're about, 15 miles or so out of Plymouth, we're over a bit of rough ground that's particularly Pollock friendly and that's generally what we're trying for at the moment. What I'm looking for hopefully is an opportunity fish like a ling or a conger to see if they're on the game in this environment. Depth of the water about 180 feet, the wind about a four, frisky I would call it today, making life just a little bit more unstable and a little less pleasant than would be ideal. But by locking myself onto the side of the boat, by managing to get myself upwind of it as it were, all my rigs and gear are heading away and less likely to tangle with them. The rods on the other side of the boat are all probably coming underneath and fishing generally underneath the boat as we speak and I've put on a bigger weight to try and drop down sharper but I'm probably in effect somewhere about 15 yards away from the boat down the bottom there now. I haven't had a single nibble in any shape or form, I haven't even got pouting or anything like that having a little grab. So I may bottle out in a while and have a go and see what they're doing with the pollock fishing. Trying to get the timing right here. As Warren comes up, I'm going back down. Fish nearly up, where are we? Try and keep it away from my line. Good condition early summer fish. Noticeably caught on a black lure. That's something we'll talk about in a while. Running deep water, probably pitch black down there. Why are we using black lures? Black lures, eh? Why does a black lure work in the dark? Simply the answer is, I don't know. I might ask the skipper later, but I've caught more pollock probably on black Eddystone lures than any other one. And that's all it actually is down there. This tiny little bit of flappy rubber with a finely designed tail and a hook so that when it's coming through the water, the fish in pursuit comes along behind at whatever pace you may be reeling it in, by the way, grab, hook, that's the action, that's the point of the action. Sometimes, just a cheat, we'll pop a tiny bit of worm on there just to create a bit of niff, but I think it's more to do with the movement through the water that actually makes the thing hit, like the opportunity for it to work for me today really as well. Because I think nearly everyone but me and Roger, the old timers for Plymouth, have had Pollock so far. Fat lady sings, know what I mean? Alton Towers time. In comes another nice little pollock. But they are getting smaller. I'm gonna 
come around and have a look, but hopefully still live mine down there as well. How decisive. You're going to be looking at about 40 pounds. Okay. Gambling weight, eh? Before seeing it. Yeah. There's actually a string of power holding hands. Don't fall through that gap. I'll try not to. A bit of plunge there. You might have picked up a bit of my line as well, right? Yeah. yeah, sign of a fish. Okay, well done, Rod. Squealy Ely. Okay, Conger Eel over the side. <laughs> this is it! Get it, right now, fast! Get out of the Get in! Wait, hold on to the ah. Come on, Bonnie! Get this, get this, get this! Come on, get this! Get this, get this! Get Lift, good. Drop the rod and wind in the slack. Lift, 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 lift. Good man, you're coming away from the wreckage. Lift, good. Wind it in. Wind, drop the rod and wind in the slack. You get in there, okay. Conger off. And as is often the case, with good British saltwater angling, the odds have now changed and we're having a bit of a conga bash. I've just brought in a fish round about the 25 pound mark, baiting up as fast as I can to get it back over. Warren needs to lift his rod just a little more, give Dave a chance with a gaff. Pleasant, healthy fish. Eddie's got one on at the back. Jeff's got a decent fish up the front. Fish on the surface back there, one on the deck. Good this, isn't it, sometimes? How you doing, Jeff? We reach the end of what has been an exhilarating day of windy charter boat fishing. Everyone will sleep well in their land-based beds tonight, with the cobwebs well and truly blown out of their systems. While we head back to our various jobs tomorrow with sunburnt ears and wind-burnt noses, Dave will of course be cleaning off the boat and preparing for the next collection of crazy anglers who seek the large species available to the rod and line boat anglers in the fine waters around our wonderful island domain.